Welcome everyone. It's so nice to, to see you here today on this late, late March day, late in the term. Um, I'm sure you're all you're all very excited <laughs> or you know feeling feeling ready for the end of the term and, and the leap into exams. So um, we're we're so grateful to have you here today um, to chat with us. Um, and today we are we are talking about um, health health professions, um, applying to health profession programs. Um, and any sort of tips and tricks um, that you can pick up uh, to improve, you know, how how your applications take shape. Um, just to backtrack a little bit, um, I, uh, I'm Allison, by the way. I'm from the Faculty of Science. I work in the Dean's Office as a program coordinator. Um, and earlier this term, we launched um, the Pathway Exploration Weeks, which some of you may have been seeing um, a lot of emails about or some stuff on our, our Instagram. Um, and basically, we, we launched this as a way to connect our students with uh, professionals in the field, with our wonderful alumni, with graduate students, with advisors, with industry experts, um, as a way to network, ask questions, and learn about the really uh, unique and diverse career paths and sort of next steps that you can take after your BSc. Um, yeah, we've, we've been running this all winter term. This is actually our last event, so you'll stop hearing from us. <laughs> Um, after today, if, if some of you have been uh, are sick of hearing us through email. So um, yeah, we're just so pleased to have you all here with us um, today. Um, I also wanted to mention that by attending this workshop um, and any of the workshops in the Pathway Exploration Weeks, uh, you can get recognition on your co-curricular record, which is really great. So if for those of you who don't know, the co-curricular record is kind of a, a parallel transcript sort of that you receive um, when you graduate and it just kind of captures all of the out of the classroom stuff that you um, that you did um, while you were here with us at Dalhousie. So um, go look up the Pathway Exploration Weeks, add yourself as a workshop participant um, and this will get added to your co-curricular record which is great. So today um, our focus is on the health professions and we are joined by Dr. Julie Jordan from the Medical Sciences Program. Um, Julie is the program and honors coordinator and instructor and I know advises many 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 students every year on just what we're going to be talking about today so um, I think Dr. Jordan has some tips and tricks um, to share with us today and is here to address some of you know the common myths about um, applying to programs and and answer any questions that you might have at the end so with that I'm going to turn it over to you Julie and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and um, I know you have a presentation, so. I do. Thank you, Allison, for that yeah. introduction. Uh, let me just. Sometimes when I share things on Teams, I've shared the wrong thing, like recipes and pictures of my dog. So if that happens, just stand by. <laughs> Hopefully. OK. I've done the same. <laughs> so right. I'm just going to. Um, come into my slideshow so <clears throat> and Allison is going to be in charge of questions so if you have questions and you want to put them in the chat or you put your hand up then by all means do that and Allison will give me a heads up so I'd first like to start to by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq and the ancestral and ceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people and that we are all treaty people Okay, so again, I'll just um, repeat what Allison said, and thank you everybody for joining joining us today, especially this late in the term and so close to your exams. I'll um, try and give you kind of a brief overview, and and I'd like to state right off the top that I am not an advisor for professional programs, and your best source of information is probably the websites of the schools and programs in which you have an interest. But I am going to share with you some things that I've learned along the way through my advisor role in the medical sciences program, and then we'll hopefully be able to address whatever questions you might have. So let's get started. See, already my. Um, I can't advance my slides. OK, here we go. So I'm sure many of you are aware of the multitude of possibilities uh, when it comes to health professions. 
there are a ton out there and I obviously can't cover all of them, but I'm going to give you some insight into some of the more popular choices. And these are not restricted to anyone in particular. You can pursue wherever your interests might take you. And that's why I want to maybe um, clarify some common myths about who's eligible to apply to what programs. So I'm going to start with medicine because it seems to be one of the more professional, more popular professional programs where students have a lot of questions. So right off the top, let's talk about some of the common myths. So the first one is that you have to have a science degree in order to apply to med school. And this is absolutely not true. Uh, a lot of the med schools across the country are looking for well-rounded individuals and they could come from backgrounds in music, in engineering, nursing, could be science, could be something else. Essentially, what you have to remember is that you want to meet the minimum admissions requirements, which in most cases are GPA and MCAT based. And for the school, there are some schools that have subject requirements, but fewer and fewer schools across Canada are actually uh, requesting specific courses now. But if, if the programs do have those requirements, obviously you just have to make sure you take those courses. So, what that means is if you're satisfying the requirements of your program that you're currently in, plus any maybe subject requirements that, let's say, UBC Medicine might have, then when it comes to electives, please, please, please take things that you enjoy. What, what are you curious about? Med school is going to teach you everything you need to know. You don't need to take any extra undergraduate courses that are needed for med school unless they actually specifically tell you you need to take more biochemistry. So that means if you want to take a course on vampires instead of anatomy, then please take the course on vampires. Another common myth is that you have to complete your honors degree in order to be eligible to apply. Now, having an honors degree is great. Uh, I'm the coordinator for our honors program, so I'm I obviously promote doing honors, but if you don't like research, do not apply to do honors. I mean, it's great preparation for graduate school. So that means if you want to pursue a master's or PhD, then doing an honors degree is your best form of preparation, but it is not a requirement for medical school. Now, Queen's University on their application does have a spot where they look for research experience. So if you do your honors, it's probably going to be helpful in that uh, particular program. And having any research experience is going to be valuable, but it, having an honors doesn't, isn't going to necessarily increase your chances of getting into med school. Which leads me to the next myth that having a graduate degree increases your chances of getting in. Now, a lot of students feel that if they complete their undergrad, and they do a master's, then their chances of getting in are going to increase. I have to say that that's not exactly true. Again, huge value in doing a graduate degree. It also provides you with a lot more, not only research and academic experience, but life experience. But when you look at an DAL or sorry, a med school application as a whole, and I said DAL because that's the one I'm most familiar with, the worth of the graduate program is not as much as you would think. You might get a few extra points in your overall application score, but it's not going to necessarily hugely increase your chances of getting in. Another common myth is that most, ex most students are accepted the first time they apply. And so a lot of students feel devastated if they are unsuccessful the first time, but it's actually quite common to apply more than once. I can tell you, the latest data from some of our students, some of them have applied two and three times. So your acceptance is really going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend on the applicant pool the year you apply, which you obviously can't control. And you have to always remember that any time that you are, if you're unsuccessful the first time and any time in between, that that is time very well spent because you're gaining more life experience 
And that is really what's very important. And that's what's going to kind of shape who you are. Within that gap year, let's say, or two, uh, who knows what could happen that could change who you are as a person or what your interests are and that sort of thing. So I guess the point is, if you apply the first time and you are unsuccessful, you're only unsuccessful in getting into med school that time. There are all kinds of other successes that might follow, you know, within that uh, period of time before you get there. And I mean, there are lots of common myths, but the last one I'm going to address is that you have to do something extraordinary to stand out. And pardon me for sounding cliche, but I'm older and I have the right to say this. <laughs> Being you and doing what you've done in your life are what make you extraordinary and what make you unique. Ticking the same boxes that everyone else has done is not what's gonna make you stand out. Now, I appreciate there are things that med schools look for and we're gonna cover that. So yes, you wanna tick those boxes, but let's say you have had to work to get through school and to work through the summer, then talk about that. Talk about the job, talk about why you've had to work. and and why that therefore left you less time to say volunteer or travel or whatever the case might be. Maybe you're an athlete, talk about that. Maybe you've had to look after somebody in your family, uh, talk about that. It's all these life experiences that are going to make you stand out. And if you're looking for things to do, make sure you do the things that interest you. Again, rather than ticking a box because you heard a bunch of other people did this thing, um, that you feel pressure to do the same thing. You don't have to feel that pressure. You have to do the things that interest you. This might not be the first time I say that, so just a heads up. <laughs> okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about eligibility for medical schools. And now this is across Canada. These are things I have found, and this is as of this year. I'll reiterate that it's really important that you check out the admissions requirements uh, on a regular basis because they can change quite rapidly. And also appreciate that not all the schools are going to have these requirements. But I will say that most of them require completion of an undergraduate degree. It might be a 90 credit hour degree or it might be a 120 credit hour degree. Almost all of the Canadian med schools have a GPA and MCAT minimum. Now, right now, Ottawa and the Northern Ontario School of Medicine do not require the MCAT, but all the other Canadian schools do. More and more med schools are starting to use the CASPER for admissions. So if you haven't heard of the CASPER, it's a 90-minute test that examines your non-cognitive and interpersonal skills. Each med school is obviously going to have some sort of application and the components are going to vary from school to school as, as well as the deadlines. But in general, you can apply before you finish your degree so that you can then enter medical school that following September or with that intent. Or you can wait and apply once you've completed your degree where you're taking a little bit more time between the completion of your undergrad and the beginning of med school. Because remember, med school is a huge commitment. You're looking at an average of at least eight years, maybe more, before becoming a practicing staff physician. So you want to make sure you're ready to make that commitment. I sound like an old lady pointing my finger, my cane. <laughs> so the interview is often a big part of the application process as well. And you'll find a lot of schools are using the multi, multiple mini interview or the MMI. And we are going to talk about this a little bit more, but not all schools are using it. And some might use a traditional style uh, interview and some might use a combination of both. With respect to international students right now, there aren't a whole lot of schools across Canada accepting international students, but McMaster, McGill and Queens right now, or as of January, are accepting a small number of international students or international applicants. Okay, extracurriculars. I get a lot of questions about what can I do? What do I have to do to be ready for med school? So again, remember to do something that you like and interests you. 
Now, there are some specific experiences that med schools are looking for, and that one of them is probably going to include some kind of exposure to the healthcare world. I mean, they don't want you applying to med school and having no idea what it's like to, to be a physician or what it's like to work in a hospital. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're limited to the hospital setting either. You might have an opportunity to shadow your GP in a private clinic or help out with filing or something like that and see the day-to-day -day running of a clinic. There are a lot of health-associated organizations like the Alzheimer's Society or the, any cancer societies that are either provincial or federal, anything like that. There are a lot of nonprofit health-related organizations long-term care facilities, and, and a lot of other opportunities for you to gain some kind of experience or exposure in the healthcare world. I would also recommend some community involvement, and that actually might tie into the healthcare exposure, but it could be something completely different. You could be volunteering at Seniors Bingo or helping out at a soup kitchen, or maybe you're a lifeguard, or you might be walking dogs for elders or somebody in your community. Any kind of participation in your community is going to be helpful. And then there's research. So this is, again, coming back to those myths where a lot of students believe they have to have research experience uh, in order to be eligible to apply to med school. But it's not the case, again, unless it's maybe a school like Queen's where they're specifically looking for it. And I would say probably a lot of the applications have a place where you can add research experience, but it's not going to be uh, a requirement. And remember again, that all of your life experiences are gonna to count towards your uh, application. Okay, so let's talk about Dalhousie Medicine in particular, um, since most, most students at Dal are from the Maritimes, and so Dalhousie Medicine is going to be where you're most um, likely to be accepted just because the med schools across Canada, most of them except maybe in Ontario, are provincially regulated, which means they protect seats for students within their region. So at Dalhousie, to be eligible to apply, you have to meet a minimum GPA of 3.3 on a 4.0 scale if you're a maritime student, or a 3.7 if you're from outside of the maritimes. This link that I show you here will take you to a conversion table from the 4.3 grade to the 4.0. Now, Dalhousie very recently changed how they're calculating their GPA which I think is fantastic because it takes a lot of pressure off of having to carry a full course load. Now, there are some other med schools that require you have a full course load, which might mean four or five courses per term, but Dal has removed that requirement. So what they're now going to do is take the 60 most recent credit hours of graded courses from a completed or in progress undergraduate degree. So that means in progress with the intent of graduating. Or, and this is where having graduate work might be helpful, they could use 15 credit hours, so that's five courses uh, from your completed or in progress graduate degree, plus the remaining 45 coming from your undergrad. So they will count fall winter and spring summer courses if they contribute to your degree. So if they're part of the degree requirements and you take them in the spring and summer as well, they'll count them. They will not count the pass or credit no credit courses, won't be included in the GPA calculation. Now this is what I found was interesting. If you repeat a course and both grades fall within the 60 most recent credit hours, then both will be included in the GPA calculation. And finally, if you do study abroad, then they'll need numerical grades for those courses. Okay, so if we talk about the MCAT, at, and these are Dow's um, specific requirements, you have to achieve a minimum score of 499, 
if you're a maritime student or 503 if you're a non-maritime student. And if you're, if, if you're not sure, the highest you can get on the MCAT is 528, which uh, there's very low percentage who get that high of a score. The thing with the DAL MCAT requirement is the higher your GPA, the lower the MCAT score requirement becomes. So that means that 499 on the MCAT is equivalent to a GPA of the 3.3 on the four scale. So if you get a higher GPA, then that um, MCAT requirement drops. The other little caveat to this is even if you still, you, you sorry, you still have to get a minimum of 123 on each section. So that means if you get lower than 123 on any section, it doesn't matter how much better you do in the other sections or if your total still meets the minimum, if you haven't got that 123 on each section, they consider you ineligible. Uh, when it comes to the test, the MCAT, it can be pretty pricey. So there are fee assistant programs. So the Association of Faculties of Medicine of Canada can provide financial assistance for the MCAT and other admission tests like the DAT and the CASPER. And for Dow, contact the Global Health Office because they have more information on this. The CASPER requirement at Dow is going to vary from year to year and does depend on the applicant pool. So if we talk about format for the MCAT, uh, there are four different sections. There's the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems, the critical analysis and reasoning skills, the CARS, and this is a section that can sometimes be challenging for students. And actually some med schools have a minimum score requirement for this section. There's also a section on biological and biochemical foundations and a psychosocial uh, section. The test is offered several times a, a year. And historically, this is another common question that I get, when should I write the MCAT? So historically, students would write it after their third year because that's when they would have completed all the courses required to help them prepare. But I am finding that more and more are writing it after year two. And I think it's because it gives the student a bit more time in the event that you have to write it again, which is also not uncommon. Um, plus, you might not feel ready after year two. so. Dow, the good thing is a lot of schools will accept um, you writing the exam later into the summer of the application year. So, so for example, Dow will accept it as late as mid-August. There are prep courses available. The ones I'm most familiar with are Prep 101 and Princeton Review, but there might be others. But let me be clear, you do not have to do a prep course in order to do well on the MCAT. It's really a personal choice. I mean, one of the advantages is that if you're not great with time management, these prep courses really keep you on schedule as far as your studying goes, and they, they provide practice tests, which are really, really important. But if you're really good with time management, you might not find that the prep course is going to provide you any extra advantage. The other thing is that there's a significant cost associated with the with these prep courses. I know Prep 101 right now charges $2,500 Canadian dollars, which to me just seems ludicrous. So it's really inhibiting. Um, it's basically for the privileged. So uh, there is some uh, assistance available. You, there are some bursaries available to help you finance that. If you don't go with the prep course, then I'd recommend that you still invest a little bit in practice tests because learning how to write the um, exam is as important as knowing the content. I mean, if you think about it, you're gonna be sitting in front of a computer for seven hours, more or less. So staying fresh, knowing what to expect is really important. Doing the practice test is gonna help you do that. Okay, so the although the MMI is pretty common, not every med school is going to use that, as I mentioned before, where some might be traditional or a combination. Now at Dow, they do use the MMI. And when things are face-to-face, -face, there are uh, 10 stations of, with, of eight minutes each with a two-minute break in between. 
The questions are posted outside the door. A buzzer rings for you to begin. You go into the interview room where there'll be one interviewer and there may be an actor to participate in role play. And it might be just you or there may be another interviewee there as well. Now, because of COVID, they've had to do a lot of online stuff, including some online MMA, MMI, not MMA. That's pretty funny. <laughs> it might lead to MMA. I don't know. But um, so pay attention to this because in the future, you might see that some schools are deciding to give you the option or might solely be going online. And the things that they're going to look for are, as far as skills go, they're looking for your communication skills, your problem solving ability, your teamwork, decision making, and your ability to share opinion and your justification of those opinions. And what you'll find is the most commonly covered issues found in the MMI are going to be ethical dilemmas in healthcare, situations about our healthcare system, the med school program itself your qualifications and any current events. So these are the things you want to be familiar with. And there are workshops available, so definitely take advantage of those. I know student success usually holds at least one of these a year. Um, for Dow Med, they also have uh, equity admissions. And this statement is straight from their website. So as long as you meet the minimum academic and non-academic requirements, those applicants who voluntarily self-identify and apply under their education equity statement are considered on the basis of their qualifications rather than in relation to the other candidates. So you're not compared to any other candidates based on your qualifications alone. So the Dow admissions breakdown looks like this. You can see that the GPA and the MCAT don't seem to have a high value, but these are basically what you get, get you in the door. They're what are going to get you the interview, these and the CASPER. Your supplemental information, which will include extracurricular activities, personal interests, volunteer uh, work experience, and any awards and achievements, and even research if you happen to do that, plus the essay, which is, I'm gonna talk about in a second, those are worth a total of 30 points. So in your essay, this is basically a personal statement as what brought you to the decision to pursue medicine. And it should go beyond wanting to help people. I think they assume that if you want to be a physician, you want to help people. But it might include a single experience that happened in your life, something in your upbringing, a job you had, anything that drove you to decide on medicine as a career. So really take some time to reflect deeply and be honest and true to yourself in the writing. Don't write what you think they want to read. They'll be able to pick up on that. Make sure you include qualities and skills that you have that are applicable to the study and practice of medicine and how your experiences have helped to, development, to develop them. So the admissions committee is interested in your community connections, as I mentioned before, relationships, your experiences in group settings, hearing about challenges, successes, adversities, strengths and weaknesses, all which make you an ideal applicant. They really don't want a chronological list of your achievements. Okay, uh, you can see that the interview is worth 40. So this is the biggest chunk of your um, application for Dow. So that's why it's important to maybe practice and really prepare well. And then a small portion called discretionary is worth five points. And these are points that are at the quote unquote discretion of the person reviewing your file. So they might include but aren't limited to research or publications, varsity sports, excellence in a particular field, discipline or activity like dance or music, writing, community service, scholarships received in university, recognition for community service, any exceptional circumstances that you overcame. But you'll see, again, the maximum you can get with all of these things is five points. Okay, so this is what um, Dalmed says. Think about the qualities a medical student should have, 
reflect on your own unique experiences in education, which provides evidence of these qualities. For qualities you are still developing, make sure you seek out new experiences that will help to develop these qualities. And so they look at interpersonal competencies, intrapersonal competencies, thinking and reasoning, and science. And you see how science doesn't have a huge weight compared to the other things. So keep that in mind. And just to wrap things up with the medicine, so this is what the class of 2024 looks like. They had 800 and so almost 900 applications, including New Brunswick applications from maritime students, 424 for nine seats. And then there's another category which where they had nine applications. So they accepted a total of or confirmed a total of 127 students. 79 were from Nova Scotia, 32 were in New Brunswick, which means those students are, are being educated in, on the New Brunswick campus. Six from PEI, nine non-maritime, and one other. The average GPA of those that were uh, offered seats was 3.8 on the 4.0 scale, and the average MCAT was 508. Now, I think it's also important to note that the average age was 25 which means that not everyone got in straight out of undergrad. And actually the age range was between 21 and 38. Okay, so I'm gonna just stop briefly there in case anyone has any questions about med school. And so I can have a drink. <laughs> Feel free to use the hand up or put something in the chat and I can relay it to Julie. Okay, I'm gonna just move on and then we can maybe. Oh, we do have one question. From... Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, like uh, maybe some good ways or good people to get as references, because I know some applications require like academic references and stuff. Right. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so you want your references to be people that know you. And so if you say you've done well in one or two classes, you could approach the professor that has taught you in those classes and they may be able later could potentially provide a reference. If you've spoken to an academic advisor, uh, they may be able to speak to your abilities. Anyone where you've had a few interactions with that can reflect on your um, academic strengths and any kind of involvement you've had in particular courses or societies or anything like that, those would all be good examples of academic references. Thank you. You're welcome. We've got a question from Kaylin. Go ahead. Okay. I was wondering if there were any limitations towards uh, like uh, piercings, hair color, like tattoos, anything like that when you're applying to med school that might like hold you back? Um, I don't think, I'm not an admissions committee, so I can't say for certain, but I think the only time that, say, a piercing might be, I don't want to say an issue, but I'm just thinking about if you're doing a clinical rotation or something like that, where it might actually impact your, like, some kind of, I don't know, sterility or your, if it interferes with your ability to do a certain technique or something like that. But I don't think, I don't know, actually. I mean, it would seem a bit discriminatory, to say the least, to, to, um, prevent someone from pursuing it because of that. Now, there is probably going to be, I know in Dow Medicine, they have kind of a professional's piece to, 
to the curriculum and they probably have certain criteria that fall under professionalism, I would recommend that maybe you talk to uh, somebody in student affairs in med schools where you're interested to find out if there are any limitations with regards to that. I, I can't foresee it, but I, I don't want to say for certain because I don't know for certain. Awesome. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, I think we had a hand up from Ernest as well. Go ahead, Ernest. I had, a, I had a quick question about the whole education equity, and I noticed on the website that it lists African Nova Scotians and Indigenous persons. Um, is Are those the only two groups that are kind of represented under that policy, or is it to, like, does it encompass um, just in general visible minorities? I think it depends on the, on the med school for sure. I think for Dalhousie, they focus on Black Nova Scotian and Indigenous Nova Scotian applicants um, for medicine. Now, I think there are other programs at Dalhousie that have equitable admissions policies that are a little bit more expansive, and they will actually list the students that are included. Um, and again, I think it, it's going to vary and your best bet is to confirm with the admissions committees or their or their advisors how specific they are when it comes to self-identification. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, Julie, we have two questions in the chat here. Okay. I'm wondering if if we want to address them now or if you want to kind of get to the other pieces and then we'll come back to these questions at the end. Yeah, let's do that. OK, sounds Thank good. Thank you for those of you who submitted the questions in the chat. We'll, if we don't get to them right away, then we can certainly add to them after after yeah. the hour. OK, good. Thanks. OK, so I'm going to move on to dentistry. And again, I I. I want to look at common requirements across Canadian programs with the um, qualifier that not all schools are going to require all of these things. But I've found that there, most of them are looking at a completed undergraduate degree, and that degree is probably going to include six credit hours in physics. Almost all the dental programs require a full year physics. Some of them might either require a minimum GPA or a competitive GPA based on the applicant pool, which is going to vary from school to school. There's a supplementary application, and which for Dow is due in February. But a lot, most of the schools want you to have some exposure to the profession. And they've stated that if you're not able to arrange that on your own, then you can actually contact the faculty of dentistry. This is for Dal anyway, and they'll help facilitate that. But I would say most of the programs, if you have kind of like med school, if you've had some exposure to the dent, the practice of dentistry, uh, that's probably going to be fairly important. There's an interview component, which it seems most of them use a traditional structured interview, which I'm going to address shortly. And some now are requiring the CASPER as well. And there are a lot of med schools, unlike, or sorry, a lot of dental programs, unlike the med schools that are accepting international students. Uh, the other thing which I seem to have skipped over is the DAT, the dental admissions test. And uh, I would say most of the programs across Canada require that. So it's recommended that if you write the DAT, that you write it a year before applying. And the trick with the DAT, unlike the MCAT, is it's only offered twice a year. So you'll want to know your deadlines for the different schools programs so you know when best to write it. It's it, kind of like the... The MCAT, it's made up of four sections, the natural sciences, there's a reading comprehension section, a, a perceptual ability and manual dexterity, but not all the schools require uh, the manual dexterity score. Uh, just like for the MCAT, there's prep material available for the DAT and there are some sources of financial support for it as well. 
Uh, when it comes to the interviews, as I said, they're going to be structured, which means that all the applicants receive the same type of question. And there's usually two to three interviewers and you're assessed on integrity, communication skills, and conscientiousness. It's a somewhat short interview, I would say. It takes about 40 minutes and usually the schools are hosting these in the spring. And the Canadian Dental Association does have practice questions available online. At Dalhousie, the students who have the highest grades are the ones that are selected for an interview. And so that usually means that they're going to interview twice as many people as seats available. This is what uh, the Dalhousie dentistry stats look like. They accept up to 40 candidates and they usually receive over 500 applications for those seats. They give preference to Atlantic Province's permanent residents and the seats go to those with the highest GPA, that score, uh, your, the, your resume, references in your interview. And with successful Dow uh, candidates, it's been shown that they get at least a 15 on each section of their DAT. So very brief about dentistry. So maybe again, if you have questions, you can plop them into the chat and we'll move on to um, pharmacy. So kind of just highlighting the top big ones that I often get questions about, and then we'll talk briefly about uh, some other options. So all the pharmacy programs across Canada are now PharmD programs. So they're more of a graduate level program, which means you have to have some undergraduate coursework before being eligible to apply. And that coursework is usually the equivalent of two years of undergrad. And what I found is this usually includes uh, six credit hours in English, uh, six credit hours in calculus, and sometimes six credit hours in physiology or physics. I'm not talking about the PCAT here because right now there's only one school and that's Manitoba that requires it, but it's an admissions test like the DAT or the MCAT. But more and more schools are, uh, pharmacy programs are requiring the CASPER as well. Right now, uh, Memorial in Newfoundland requires it. Saskatchewan, Toronto, and Waterloo also use it in their application process. And there will be an application component and an interview, which could be the MMI, um, or it could be traditional, or it could be a combination of both. Now, with regards to admissions, again, Dalhousie Pharmacy has equitable admissions policy. Um, and they also weigh heavily the value of the interview where it's worth 60% of the total application um, package. Okay, so let's talk about some other options. I just want to, I apologize if I'm rushing a little bit, but I want to give you enough time to ask questions. So there's a there are lots of other professional programs in healthcare that you can pursue. These are just some of them, um, but uh, maybe some that you hadn't heard of or you didn't even consider. So there's nursing, there's physician assistant, and optometry, each of which I'm gonna talk just briefly about. There's osteopathy, where training's available at the Canadian College of Osteopathy in Ontario or in the UK. Genetics counseling, which has training at UBC, Manitoba, Toronto, McGill, and Montreal. There are health profession technologies like x-ray, radiological tech, ultrasound, nuclear medicine, and medical lab tech programs. And those ones are all available at Dalhousie. So let's talk about nursing first. Right now, there are two programs available at Dal. One is direct entry from high school, uh, and then there is the advanced standing, which those of you who are attending today would be probably what you would be considering. So you, again, there are some course requirements where you have a minimum B minus needed in an anatomy course. It's usually anatomy 1010, six credit hours in physiology, or if you want to combine three credit hours in physiology and 
three in a biological science, you can do that instead. Uh, an introductory stats course, I've listed 1060 here, micro 2100, and three credit hours in English writing. And then you have electives that are required as well. Now they state a minimum GPA of 2.5 is required for your most recent 30 credit hours and overall. But please be sure that this does not guarantee entry. Nursing is actually one of the most competitive programs at Dell and they have a ton of applicants vying for 96 seats. So that means the competitive average is gonna be much higher than 2.5. And it also means that most of the seats are going to Nova Scotian applicants. However, they also have an equity admissions policy and those are for um, self-identifying black Nova Scotian and indigenous Nova Scotian applicants. The, the Dow nursing program also requires completion of the CASPER. Okay, so now I wanna talk about physician assistant. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. It's not that, it's fairly new in Canada. And it's an assistant, physician assistant is defined as an advanced practice healthcare provider. So you perform histories, physicals, you order and interpret investigations, diagnose, formulate treatment plans. Um, a PA, as they're affectionately referred to, also perform diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, reduce fractures, casts and splints, perform biopsies, assisted surgery sometimes, educate and counsel patients around preventative health. They work under the supervision of a physician. They're not always going to be doing all of these things, but these are some of the things that the physician assistant is going to do. They're not doctors. They're not nurses, they'd be more like a nurse practitioner. And they're definitely not admin assistants where they're taking, you know, taking notes. So if you're interested in medicine, but are not thrilled about the huge commitment around med school, but you still want to be involved, then physician assistant might be something that you want to, in, at the very least, investigate. Uh, it's still considered new in Canada, as I said, but um, in the U.S., the PAs have been around for a long time. Uh, in Canada, because it's new, they're regulated in some provinces and not in others. So right now, there is training available at McMaster, um, Toronto, through the Canadian Forces, and there's a master's level program in Manitoba. So MAC requires two years of undergrad with a GPA of three on a four scale. And U of T requires a the same, but a little less on the GPA, but a huge amount of healthcare experience. Canadian Forces is, um, program is obviously only open to those who are members of the Canadian Forces. Um, to find out more about physician assistants, there's these two links. One is Canadian Association of Physician Assistants, CAPA. And then there's this blog called the CanadianPA.ca, which is fantastic. Um, they provide a huge amount of information and kind of reflect on life as a PA in Canada. Okay, so then there's optometry. So there are only um, two schools in Canada that offer training in optometry, and that's Waterloo and Montreal. And then there are programs in the U.S. So if you were... Uh, looking at Waterloo, you have to have a BSc with five courses per term. So this is where course load might be important. And then three credit hours in an English, ethics, psych, micro, chemistry with a lab, biochemistry, organic chemistry with a lab. Uh, actually, I don't know if it needs a lab or not. Uh, calculus and stats. And then six credit hours in a biology with a lab, physiology, and physics. They have a minimum overall uh, average requirement of 75%. Now they may have a competitive average, which is higher than that. And they require a Casper plus a Casper snapshot, which is something I wasn't familiar with. So it's like a mini Casper, but you also have to do the full Casper as well. And you have to complete the admissions test for, the, for optometry, which is the OAT and uh, has a minimum score of 300, which won't mean much to you until you actually look at what the ode is, but gives you a little peek. 
So then if none of those appeal to you, then there's more. You might consider a career in communications disorders like speak language, speech language pathology or audiology. You might consider physio physiotherapy or occupational therapy, social work, community health and epidemiology. All of these programs um, are at a master's level and are currently offered at Dow. So worth exploring if they pique your interest in any way. Okay, Whew. so I'm sorry we only have 10 minutes left, but I'm also available. I should have put my email, maybe um, we can put it in the chat. I'm gonna unshare um, and then hopefully address any questions. Thank you so much. I think, wow, that was extremely thorough. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, and, and I, meant, I mean that in the best way possible. Um, I think it's it's so, so helpful. And I'm just going to put your your your, your med site email here uh, in the okay. chat, if that's all right, Julie. Yeah. Um, so before we do a, another round of, of hands up, um, there was a question here from Sarah. Yeah. Um, was wondering how long students typically study before taking the MCAT. Thank you. Uh, good question, Sarah. What I find is, let's say you were going to write in August, you're probably going to prepare most of the summer. So, and I think that's why students do it in the summer, so that they can dedicate that time. Now, it really depends on you. It depends on your abilities. You might not need all that time. Um, you might be able to, you know, I wouldn't say two weeks is enough preparation. But I don't know, maybe a month would be enough for you. It really depends on you and your abilities and how much time you can dedicate, you know, per day to to studying, what resources you're using. The prep courses usually run most of the summer and then students usually run uh, right at the end of the summer. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, feel free to put your hands up or put something in the chat um, if you have any additional questions. Um, there was a question from Sammy before, but Sammy, did I, did I answer that about the, um, the requirements for admissions into the Faculty of Health? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, but okay. I wonder if I need to take MCAT for post-diploma program. Oh yeah, that's so uh, the MCAT for the post-diploma BHSC in radiological technology. Is an MCAT required for that? Oh, I actually don't know, to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah, I'm not I'm just, I can take a look at the admissions here. Yeah, I don't, I, it, it doesn't sound, it's not ringing a bell that you would need it, but I, again, I don't wanna say you don't need it and then you, <laughs> and then you need it. It looks like um, a letter of intent, a resume, proof of registration in a professional association. Um, yes, and a resume. We can get back to you on that, Sammy, if you'd like. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, no problem. I just, I just wanna make a further comment about the co-curricular record too that Allison mentioned at the beginning. This is acts as an official document. So if you're applying to any program, you can attach that CCR to it. And it also saves you so much time than trying to go back and, you know, remember what you did when. It's kind of like your CV or your resume. I mean, keeping it up to date. So if you if you haven't uh, started putting together a, a co-curricular record, I would highly recommend it. I think it will be to your advantage to have that in place. Absolutely. I'll put the link to the, the CCR website. Okay. Here yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the group? Julie, I think you just covered off all the details that I <laughs> Okay, well, I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you'll see my email there, medsciadel.ca. Uh, I'm happy to help if I can. As I mentioned at the very beginning, 
your greatest source of information is going to be the program itself. Uh, but there are a lot of common things that you'll find with with the programs across across Canada. And I really don't know much about U.S. programs. I it's my understanding with regards to medical schools in the U.S. that you have to have a full year of English and a full year of physics. Um, I don't know if that helps, but be, there are so many medical schools across the U.S. I couldn't possibly. Um, be able to summarize them. <laughs> oh, there's one more question from Sarah. Um, if a student isn't admitted in their first application, would you have any advice on um, what to do in that time? Thank you. Yeah, whatever interests you. I mean, if you, it's tough with sometimes because you don't receive feedback on why you weren't accepted. Uh, but I think in that time period, you're going to be gaining more experience no matter what you're doing. Um, if you find, you know, if your MCAT isn't strong enough, then you might consider rewriting the MCAT. But I think, you know, or if you feel that maybe you, wish you had had more time in a community or that you do want to see what research is like, any of those things, you can do those things during that time. Uh, I think as long as you're doing something, then uh, it's, it's experience, right? And it's going to add to what you have to contribute. I'm sorry I don't have a more specific list of things you should do, but, I, you know, this comes from a physician who recently gave a little workshop to our students and that's what she kept saying just do what you like do what interests you that's what makes you unique that those are the things that you have to bring to the table um yeah awesome thank you all right i think we have time for one more question if there's okay. if there's anyone with a question if not and we can close three minutes early. <laughs> so just a last call for questions from the group. Give it the awkward few seconds. <laughs> All right. Well, I think um, if there aren't any further questions, then um, we'll we'll wrap things up here. And thank you so much, Julie, for such a fantastic overview. Um, is there, um, maybe, maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing the presentation or Absolutely. your presentation, there's just so many excellent details in there that I'm sure our group today would really, um, love to follow up with some of those. So yeah. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining and one final plug for the co-curricular record. Um, please feel free to add, to add this workshop and, and we'll make sure to get you approved. So thank you so much, everyone. Good luck on your exams. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Um.